Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Hannah Kay, and I work on the live events for Intelligence Squared. A big thank you to Tim Marlowe and our very distinguished panel of speakers for coming this evening, and also to Rebecca Wilson and the Saatchi Gallery for putting together this debate and hosting it for us. Before I hand over to Tim, I'd just like to flag up some of our forthcoming Intelligence Squared events. We've got two more to go this season, both on a geopolitical theme. Next Monday, June the 27th, we have David Miliband and other experts from Oxford Analytica who are coming to the Royal Geographical Society to talk about the world 10 years on after 9-11 and share their insights into the global order of tomorrow. And on Friday, July the 1st, we have the man known as the Elvis of cultural theory, Slavoj Žižek. He's going to be at Cadogan Hall and giving his rather more idiosyncratic take on the state of the world and predicting what he sees as the imminent collapse of the global financial system. Now, tomorrow, we launch our autumn season of events, um, which kicks off in early September and promises to be our starriest season yet. We've got our usual range of debates on foreign and domestic issues, and speakers include Pervez Musharraf, William Dalrymple, Tristram Hunt, and David Willits. We've got a cycling festival with Will Self and Jeff Dyer, and we're extremely proud to announce that we have the former US president, Jimmy Carter, who's going to be interviewed by Jon Snow for us at the festival hall. And we've also got special events with the cognitive scientist, Steven Pinker, the writer and semiotician, Umberto Eco, and the French public intellectual, Bernard-Henri Lévy. Details of all these autumn events should be up on our website tomorrow at intelligencesquared.com. Thank you. If, um, if this weren't such a distinguished panel, um, I'd be feeling emasculated after that roll call. Um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll live up to the challenge of, um, of what else you're doing later this season. I like the idea that um, Intelligence Squared works in seasons. Um, of course, museum, museums do, but not in the same way that things like football do. And even now in the close season, our newspapers are dominated by the stories of what's going to happen in the next season. And yet, this is a cliche, but it's, it's a fact as well. More people go to museums and galleries in Britain every year than go to professional football matches. However, what those statistics actually tell us about the viewer's relationship to the art itself and whether it matters or not is not something that is necessarily revealed. But it's something that we're going to kick about tonight with a panel that is made up of Alan de Botton, Ben Lewis, Matthew Taylor, who will be speaking um, for the motion, which I'll tell you about in a minute, but I think you know it anyway, and against the motion, Matthew Collins, Chris Durkon, and Sandy Nairn. The motion itself is that museums are bad at telling us why art matters. And what I want to do first, before each of the speakers has their say, and before we kick it out to the floor and you ask us questions, and before we vote at the end, is to take a show of hands now and see what the mood of the room is and what your preconceptions are or what your, your pre-debate thoughts are. So could we have a vote, a show of hands? First of all, who is in favour, or who, who, who agrees with the motion that museums are bad at telling us why art matters? OK, thank you. Um, who, is against, who is against the motion that museums are bad at telling us why art matters? It's pretty close. Okay, and who is undecided about the motion? Okay, they're all... <laughs> that obviously should be me, but thank you for being so honest. Okay, without further ado, um, kicking off uh, for the motion, Alan de Botton. Alan. When people want to make a claim about how important museums are in our culture and what a good job it is that they do, we sometimes hear it said that museums are our new churches. And you can see why people say that. They are places of reverence. Often you have to keep a relatively hushed voice. They have high ceilings, filtered light. But there's something, there's a deeper connection. And the connection is really that these are major centers of value. So just as the cathedrals and the churches in the great days of um, Christianity 
were obvious focal points of culture. They were the places that summed up what people really believed in. So too, uh, there is the claim uh, that museums have assumed that role. They are where um, the most valuable intentions of society are to be found. Um, any surplus wealth generated by the capitalist economy is frequently summoned up and sucked in by museums. It's the most legitimate form of patronage, just in the same way as um, church architecture was. Now, I want to argue that the idea that museums are our new churches is a beautiful one, but the reality is they're not. Uh, they failed at their task. They do lots of things very well and um, wonderful restaurants and splendid gift shops and all sorts of things. But at the deepest level, museums have failed, I want to argue, art museums. And the reason they failed is they're so boring. And the reason why they're so boring is they refuse to tell us what art is for. And this isn't museums' fault. It's the fault of our culture. We have not, as a people, as a generational unit been able to come up with convincing explanations of why art matters. There are perhaps three answers out there. The modernist response to the question of what art is for is that this is an illegitimate and vulgar question. Um, to ask what something is um, means that you don't understand it, which means that you're stupid, which is why so often in museums uh, the, the dominant feeling is one of puzzlement. The dominant feeling is that someone, somewhere, understands what a particular work means, but we are somehow puzzled. We have not been let into the charmed circle, but we're very good because we know what happened to Van Gogh. We know how everybody laughed, so we're not going to make that mistake. So we're going to stay silent. If we have doubts, we're going to keep those doubts very, very private, and we're not going to let on, but in our hearts, we're going to think, what on earth was that about? Very often. Um, the other uh, uh, um, uh, response to, to art is, and its meaning is the idea that art is there for art's sake. The great rallying cry of the 19th century, art is not propaganda. Um, there was a terrific movement in the 19th century, and it continues to this day, which is to say that art automatically becomes debased if it's trying to speak up for a certain vision of life. It very quickly, very quickly, you're on a slippery slope, and at the bottom of that slope are two people, Hitler and Stalin. So you've got to be very careful that your art is not mistaken for propaganda. And the best way to do that is to say that it's just for art's sake. And if somebody comes up to you and asks you what it means or what you care about or how you think society should be arranged, if you have a political vision, if you care deeply about things, you don't give an answer because you might end up, as I say, with Hitler or Stalin. So the field is then left. The only third candidate to coming up with an answer of what art is for is academia. And academia has lots of ideas about what art might be for. And it's for things like grading works of art according to the century in which they were painted and the school uh, in which um, the stylistic trends in works of art can be uh, pinned down to. So it's essentially a kind of um, librarian's task that academics bring to bear on art. And they do a wonderful job of uh, pigeonholing artists, movements, uh, 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 trends, and this is really, this explains why captions are the way they are. If you look at most captions, they bear with them the heritage of the academic tradition. They'll tell you where something was painted, its provenance, the sort of material uh, uh, used, etc., etc. And most of us stare dumbly and with some confusion at this uh, thought. It, it seems very, very important, but actually, if we take a step back, why does it matter that this painting was made in 1483 or that it's on oil on board or whatever it is? But anyway, we have this idea that this is incredibly uh, important. Now, there's another candidate for explaining to us why art might matter. And it's a very neglected and taboo candidate, but I want to bring it out and describe it as the salvation, the possible salvation of art and museums, and that is religion. I speak as a secular person who has no interest in religion except for the lessons that it could be able to provide us in relation to works of art as to how art might fit more actively and more interestingly into our lives. Now, religions have absolutely no problem telling us what art is for. If you ask a, Chris, a Christian, um, what is art for? Art is for reminding us uh, to live a little bit more like Jesus. Uh, art is a sensory medium which should evoke for us uh, the, the, the wisdom and virtue of Jesus Christ uh, and make vivid to us his, his teachings. Now, balmy idea if you like, but a very interesting, uh, clear uh, uh, message and, and moral. So, you know, uh, take Rembrandt's uh, uh, depiction of Jesus on the uh, Sea of Galilee. 
Um, for those of you who know Rembrandt's painting, it shows the sailors um, looking fierce and heroic in the face of, of the storm. Now, we all know that Christianity should teach us to be uh, courageous in the face of our woes, but it takes a great artist like Rembrandt to make us feel that truth. So art is there to make us feel the great truths that we know as cliches, but we need reminding of. We're constantly told things like, be nice, love one another, but we don't know what that means until a great artist comes along and evokes for us really powerfully what love means, and so transforms us. So essentially, a, a tour through a church and an interaction with works of art in a church are supposed to be, is supposed to be a method for returning us to what we truly believe, what we truly want uh, of our society, and uh, the best things about humanity. That's the point of a church. Um, in a way, a balmy mission, how could one ever take anything from this? Well, my suggestion is that museums have a lot to learn from this. Museums have a lot to learn from the way that churches don't grade things by century, they don't grade things even by um, uh, schools, they muddle everything up and their only mission is try and be a bit more like Jesus. That's the mission. Now, how could we incorporate something of this into the secular world? People, the immediate answer would be to say, well, we don't believe in anything, we don't have gods, so what are we supposed to have these temples to nothing? Well, we do have gods and we do have values. We don't have gods per se, but we have things we deeply believe in. We believe in certain virtues, we believe in kindness, uh, we believe in family, uh, we believe in love, we believe in nature, etc., etc. These are the things which our museums should have at their core. We don't need a new kind of art, we need a new framing device, we need galleries that will say, this is the gallery for love, this is the gallery for family, this is the gallery for nature. These are galleries with very specific missions which are to bring to life the ideas that we most care about and to use art as a sensory medium, as propaganda for very good things. So that's an initial sketch of why I think museums have got it wrong and how, through certain lessons of religion, they might go in more fruitful directions. Thank you very much. Wonderfully pithy, as you'd expect from a, a philosopher, writer, romantic, but you conjured up a wonderful image as you were talking, Alan, of um, Nick Sarota, somehow Messiah-like, walking across the Sea of Galilee. Maybe that's something that later on Sandy or Chris can pick up on. Um, now speaking against the motion, Matthew Collins, needing no real introduction, but an award-winning broadcaster, but also an artist too. <clears throat> I'm going to speak... Uh in favour of neutrality. Um, I think uh, if Alan didn't mention it today, he might have mentioned in some of his um, <clears throat> utterances on this subject, which he's been making over the last few months, that um, there's a sort of boring kind of neutrality that museums do, uh, particularly museums of old art, and they could liven up the situation a bit if they injected a bit of passion. Um, now, uh, what I take from... Um, Alan's thesis is uh, a, a sort of an impression of bafflement that he has and boredom in museums. Why are they not whipping us up? Why are they not pointing to uh, great meanings that the works have? Why are they only telling us that uh, Piero painted the baptism of Christ in about, they don't even know the real date, in about 1450? And, um, you know, why have they put all the Venetian stuff in the Venetian room and uh, why not say uh, this is the room of passion or this is the room of courage or this is the room of tenderness since these would be emotions or virtues or values which we could relate to in, uh, with our whole being or, or the profundity of our being rather than merely saying whoa, whoa, yes in a rather sort of tedious way and uh, how marvellous that uh, Piero painted the baptism of Christ in 1450. Now, I think where Alain is going wrong is to uh, suppose that neutrality, so-called, in the museums of old art, uh, is nothing. Uh, and, that's, and the problem is the lack of something. I would say that the neutrality is there in order to encourage a reading of the great something that all the paintings have. That once you start telling everybody what the meanings are and where the meanings lie and what it is that makes a painting urgent and vital and important, 
you have to start doing a sort of isolating of qualities and virtues. So if we take that Piero painting of the baptism of Christ, which every single person in this room more or less knows, um, where would you begin to say that this is the painting of courage or this is the painting of virtue or this is the painting of um, the essential message of Christ? Which is the essential bit? And uh, which is the essentially timeless bit? And which is the bit that we can all relate to now? And which is the bit that relates to preoccupations of people in circa the 1450s? It would be very hard to do. And if you were to say, as Alan sort of slightly advocates, let's have a room of baptisms of Christ so that we can look at this great moment in uh, uh, three of the New Testament Gospels where we hear about God's manifestation on earth through this being, this super being of Jesus, the moment when he's sort of owned by God. Um, uh, what would we then do with the immense stylistic and visual differences that, ex that would exist between all those works over the immense period of, in which Christian art uh, was produced from the second or third centuries right up until the 19th century or so, where that, or the 18th century, more like early 18th century, where that stuff really dominated art production. We would be looking at a, a horrible visual jumble of different styles, uh, and we would suddenly be reminded that neutrality uh, is not merely in the service of a dried up sort of academic notion of when things happened. It's, there's also a sort of visual aim that neutrality serves. Um, when works from a certain period are put together, or works of a certain genre are put together, or works by a certain artist are put together, it is in order to put like with like, so that we can so much the better see what is strong about that work, and perhaps appreciate even more the differences between work and, one work and another, and so that we are not distracted by irrelevant differences. Neutrality uh, is never really neutral. None of these values are absolute. But neutrality is a sort of a, um, a, a, an aim that the museum inherits from the Age of Enlightenment, where people were preoccupied with the fantastic new notion of classification. Uh, we don't hold on to it. Museums don't hold on to it because of um, misguided allegiance to outmoded values that come from the 18th century. We hold on to it because it's useful. It serves the purpose of honoring that art and making that art look great. Art is primarily visual. Whatever other uh, ideas it has to serve, it has to be visually efficient to begin with. So we don't want that, that visual greatness that art gathered together in museums has to be undermined by a jumble of disparate notions that the literal meaning or the subject matter of the art might be um, showing us. Now, I have concentrated in my talk now in defense of a neutral showing of the great works of the past, of course, on the museums of the past. One of the problems, I think, in what Alain is saying is that there's a sliding back and forth between everybody's uh, very vivid picture of museums of contemporary art and museums that deal with uh, the art of history or historical art. Uh, I think they both have very different functions and very different approaches, and it's as if... Alain is asking for the sort of rather headline meanings or the meanings that can be grasped very simply that go on in contemporary art museums, but for those, the simplicity and uh, almost shallowness of those ideas to re be replaced by the profundity of the art of the past. And there's a clash there that can't be resolved. Uh, I think uh, museums of the present, like Tate Modern, are really about... Uh, whipping up interest in, in the sort of democratic processes and individualism and plurality of meanings and identities that go on at the moment. We, we applaud everyone can be an artist, everyone can have a go. Uh, the art of history is slightly different, and the reason why um, neutrality reigns in the art of the past or in the museums that show the art of the past and, does, and is not so much present in the uh, museums of the present uh, is that neutrality serves the art of the past. The art of the past has uh, much richer and greater levels and depths of profundity. It, it is telling us more in its iconographic meanings, that is the subject and the symbols, and it is giving, giving us more in the sort of aesthetic and visual richness of the art. With the art of the present, we take our chances with what's happening. We, we agree, there's a sort of agreement 
that the art of the present is lively and buzzing and clues us right into what's going on now, the attitudes of now. And we accept that there's a certain loss in a sort of sustained high level of achievement. And we don't complain about that. You know, sometimes that achievement comes through and sometimes it doesn't because other things are more fun about it. Uh, I, I don't think Alan realizes in what he's saying how much what he's asking for is already there in contemporary art museums uh, and conversely how much it would be better if it wasn't there in uh, museums of more historic art and when I say historic and contemporary I'm including classic modern art with historic you know modern art is quite different to the art of the last 15 years or so uh, modern art is much more like pre-modern art in that it in a way, it continues uh, the greatness of uh, pre-modern art, but it does it by modern means. I think contemporary art uh, is a sort of merry-go-round of all sorts of uh, marvelous diversions and distractions and entertainments and expressions of what it's like to be alive now, whereas uh, the other stuff deals with something a bit more heavy. Um, I don't know if there's been any worrying for the time to end. One minute left. I was about so to do it. in the last minute, I'd like to say that there's also um, a misconception in Alan's sort of overtures, in a way, that the art of the Christian period that goes on for so long is not, uh, I'm going to use this word, monolithic. It's not all the same. It's extremely different. It's so different that, and now you'll have to accept a bit of twisting of the meanings, it's a little bit like the art of our times in that it contains such different versions of changing society's idea of reality. There may be God there, and there may be angels, and there may be Mary, but the meanings, uh, the subtle meanings that are in those paintings in the 3rd century AD uh, up to the 15th century, up to the 17th century, or back again to the 8th century, are extremely different to each other. So to say that we are going to extract the meaning of tenderness uh, from all those different periods, or the meaning of courage or the meaning of nature, or the meaning of uh, the nurturing mother, um, would be very distorting of the complexity of meaning uh, and ideas and significance that all those different, sort of different periods of art offer. A, it would be very hard to do, and B, it would be rather a sort of brutal destruction and travesty of what is good about that art. So, in the end, I have to ask for a rousing cheer in the name of something so boring as neutrality, simply because that neutral stuff is what makes the old stuff seem so good. Beautifully, beautifully milking the audience there at the end, I thought, Matt, nice. Um, but now uh, for the motion, Ben Lewis, who's an award-winning documentary filmmaker, writer, critic, and actually has on occasion been a stand-up comedian, all of which I hope will have some bearing on what he does tonight. Ben. I, I only make jokes about the art world, but I haven't understood a lot of what's gone on so far. I have the sort of sensation that um, we're sort of all watched over by museums of loving grace, and I don't think I agree too much with that. Um, exhibit A. To you, this looks like a shoebox, right? But it's not. It's a Gabrielle Orozco. That's not a new brand of trainer. That's an artist, a white cube artist, Tim. And um, <laughs> this is a work of art that was, or something very similar to this, was shown in the museum of um, my other uh, honorary opponent there from the Tate Modern, Chris Durkon. It occupied the center of a very large room and um, it had a museum guard station next to it to make sure no one kicked it or trod on it. <laughs> now, you think I'm here to tell you that this is crap, but I would not be so presumptuous as to challenge the White Cube and Tate Modern together. <laughs> They're too big for me. What is important is not whether you think, or I think, this is a good work of art. Of course it's crap. It's the way, <laughs> no? It's the way the museum justifies its presence in the exhibition. Curator Jessica Morgan, is a, I don't want to sort of single out a particular individual, but I will, just for fun. <laughs> I'm quoting her from um, the Tate website, says about this work of art, Gabrielle has often said that he likes to disappoint people with his work. <laughs> I 
I don't have to say any more, do I? I'm not going to do this speech with a straight face. I don't have to spell you spell out, do you? That, that, that sort of means that the work's bad, but it's kind of deliberately bad, so it's good because they meant to disappoint me. There's a lot of sort of ontological kind of feedback loops that go on in the language that's used to legitimate art that really confuse me and make me feel like I'm stoned when I go to galleries. Um, <laughs> Anyway, look, this is the first reason why museums are bad at telling us why art matters. The language of art explanation and criticism is now so confused that it heaps praise on anything and everything, and it can't distinguish between what matters and what doesn't matter. Put a piece of rotting and smelly cheese on a plinth in a museum, and a curator will tell you that it questions notions of taste and decency, expands the use of the senses in the experience of the work of art beyond the domination of the eye, and draws attention to notions of time and decay, possibly even entropy, though, Alain, I can never really remember what that word means. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I was a successful contemporary artist, I could fart in an art gallery today. <laughs> and you would be reading little wall texts written by museum curators praising me for dematerializing the art object. <laughs> However, I do not want to dwell long on the wishy-washy language used to legitimize art in museums today, Many of you will know me from my investigation of the contemporary art market, and I want to now turn to the business of exhibiting art. I'm very happy that this motion has the word matters in it, and, you, and in your vote later on, I want you to make the word matter really matter. Matter can mean many things in art. Art can matter because it's popular, famous, expensive, commercially successful, but most of us would agree that what really makes art matter is when it's good and when it's long-lasting. Now, once again, I don't want to suggest to you that museums no longer care whether art is good or not, but I want to show you that they fail to distinguish between art that matters because it's good and art that matters because it's successful. Exhibit A, Exhibit B, actually, the Tate exhibition Pop Life. In autumn 2010, the Tate Modern held an exhibition called Pop Life. It was a you know, very good exhibition of the most commercialized art that has been made in the last 50 years. But Pop Life was not the original title. The original title was Sold Out. That was changed, apparently after an artist contributing to the show objected. Compare the two titles, Pure Life. Sorry, compare the two titles. Pop Life is pure celebration. Sold Out is ironic, has questions. Have these artists sold out? But the Tate gave in to censorship from the artist, and they couldn't even hint to us the real reason why this kind of art matters. Museums, in short, are in the business of telling us that art is the best thing ever, and they're doing a very good job at that. They need more money to build ever bigger extensions, to house ever more art that's available, and there is ever more art because ever more people that art believe that art is the best thing ever. So they make more of it, and more people come to see museums, so museums build bigger extensions. Ladies and gentlemen, you understand the feedback loop that's going on. This, isn't, this is evangelism. It's not culture. Museums are not in the business of saying, stop, there's a bit too much art about. <laughs> Can we have less and better, please? Exhibit C, Damien Hirst's cornucopia installation at the British Museum. In 2008, Damien exhibited cabinets full of scores of spin-painted skulls. Perhaps you saw them. I'm not going to pass comment on the quality of this art, which I think is absolutely fantastic. But ladies and gentlemen, contemporary art has become part of a marketing strategy, a photo opportunity for museums. And that is why the British Museum exhibited her skulls two years ago. And that is why they then refused to let me film it for the BBC, because they knew that I was likely to be critical about it. Museums have become not just advertising and PR agencies for art. Worse, they've become cultural fascists who tolerate no opposition voices. Heretics such as myself must be excommunicated. I'm very glad also that this motion has the word why in it. Museums are very good indeed at telling us that art matters, but they are bad at telling us why art matters. Exhibit D, the Gauguin exhibition at the Tate Modern. Wasn't it genius? What an incredibly beautiful hang and astute curating. Rare works of art carefully borrowed from museums and donors all over the world. I could have happily spent the rest of my life in that place. What effort, what scholarship. The rooms were organized along different themes. Landscape, the eternal feminine, teller of tales, earthly paradise. So I went from room to room with great anticipation, waiting for the one on the theme of pedophilia. <laughs> Not because I'm a pervert, ladies and gentlemen, but because we know that Gauguin was a sex tourist by any modern definition. 
Surely this is an important aspect of his art, something that matters today. Well, there was no room based on this theme and no text next to any paintings properly informing us about this. Why? Well, the first rule if you're running a big modern museum and you're putting on big exhibitions is don't offend the lender. <laughs> Keep the lender happy. If you were a billionaire, as I'm sure many of you are because we're in the Saatchi Gallery, and lent your $40 million Gauguin to a museum and you read a wall text next to it that contextualized it within the artist's sexual exploitation of minors, would you lend to that museum again? Exhibit E, my final exhibit, Damien Hurst at the Tate Modern in 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, next year is the year of the London Olympics, and the Tate has faced the question of how they could best celebrate or at least synchronize with this event in their program of exhibitions. They've chosen to hold an enormous exhibition of Damien Hurst. Yet I want to challenge everyone in this room to help me. Can you help me find one curator at the Tate who thinks that Hearst's art matters? Because I haven't been successful so far. I don't mean matter in the sense of being fun, popular, famous, and even influential. Right now, I mean matter in the sense of being meaningful and good and of enduring quality. Ladies and gentlemen, next year the Tate Modern will be telling us that Damien Hearst's art matters. It does matter in a certain sense, but they will not, if past performance is anything to go by, be truthful about telling us why they think it matters. Museums, in short, have become too weak in relation to the muscle of billionaire donors and star artists and in relation to the typhoon-like forces of celebrity and media. But it's not their fault. They need us, the public, to exert more pressure on them to tell us why art really matters. By supporting me and Alan, and Matthew, in this motion, you will also be helping them. You'll be helping the museums, saying to them, be stronger, be more independent, stand up for what you think is right. Thank you. Never tells us what he really thinks, does he, Ben? Um, Next up, uh, against the motion, and maybe responding to some of that, is the new director of Tate Modern, although he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't responsible for, well, for most of, uh, of, uh, of what Ben's described, although he is going to be responsible for the exhibition that's coming up in 2012. Um, Chris Durkon uh, has run museums in a number of cities uh, uh, and worked in museums in New York, Rotterdam, Munich, and now London. Um, he's also a, a filmmaker and a writer, uh, and now he's going to be an apologist um, for everything as far as the contemporary art was concerned. <laughs> Chris. Dear Tim, I hope that after this uh, intervention by Ben that I get 30 seconds extra because I want to show something. Can I have your box? <laughs> now, I'm going to do a little game with you all. I want you now to shut off the right side of your brain and just feel this box for five seconds. Just feel this box. Five, four, Three, two, one. Stop feeling, okay? Just stop feeling. Now shift to the other side of your brain. I want you for five seconds just not to feel, but to think about this box. Think. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop. Okay? Now, probably when you did this five seconds of feeling, you felt something really beautiful, like Ellen the Bottom was talking about. It's true, it's white, it feels soft, has a beautiful form. You felt it, it came to you, it was hoovering in the room. <laughs> now, when you started thinking, maybe you felt that Ben Lewis was inside here and that he deserved like this box in the rooms of Tate Modern, a kind of trap, because that's what happened. No, Ben. What I meant is imagine, think about the fact that in this box was one pair of beautiful shoes, Louboutin. 
Now, now it becomes something, isn't this, this box? Hey, not Ben Lewis, but a pair of Louboutins, 2,000, 2,000 euros, 2,000 pounds. I'm going to talk about the difference between feeling and thinking and why it matters that we keep thinking, keep speaking about art. Can you keep your box? Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was the excerpt, 30 seconds. The museum to call the Snide Comment by French poet Paul Valéry came into being when sculpture and painting lost their mother architecture to death. Like orphans, the two arts wandered homeless through the world until the museum offered them a sanctuary. Paul Valéry's idea that paintings and sculptures get to be exhibited only as orphans inspired the notion of aesthetical pleasure, a form of isolation, an isolation Dear Ellen, an isolation from the real world. As a consequence, art got to be an experience rather than a discourse. And some of us, we heard them tonight, some of us still like this idea. And why not? However, with the rise of the avant-garde at the beginning of the 20th century, think of the so-called ready-mades of Marcel Duchamp, for instance, this white box could be a ready-made, the implementation the implementation of a work of art got to be distinguished from execution. Execution consists of making a work, implementation of making it work. And that's what we just did with the thinking feeling of the white shoebox. Implementation, however, cannot do without discourse, without, for instance, imagining that there is Le Boutin in that box. Implementation cannot do without discourse, challenging people to meet, to talk, and to take a stand. Indeed, artworks, the artworks of the avant-garde, could and cannot, in order to make them work, speak for themselves, in contrast, for instance, to advertisement campaigns. Those artworks succeed in challenging thinking in domains other than those to which they ostensibly belong, and indeed, such makes you think. Theory means originally a theater of thinking. Thinking about art equals indeed speaking about art and in many different ways. But it's first and for foremost to speak about conflict of interest. And that's what we are doing tonight. That's why more often than not speaking about art sounds very confusing. I found Alan, the bottom, very confusing. I found Ben Lewis very confusing. I hope not to be so confusing. It's all part of the art discourse. Indeed, museums are places where all sorts of interests are in continual conflict and negotiation. Those of the very different artworks, styles, and aesthetic viewpoints, those of art versus society, those of monetary versus aesthetic values, and those of the subconscious versus the conscious, and those of feeling versus thinking. Learning to listen to these conflicting interests and sort them out is one of the joys of looking at art. The rise of the avant-garde reflected also a fundamental change in the relationship between art and society, a change that was set in motion as public, and in great numbers, gained access to our institutions of art. Viewed historically, the public presence and therefore the speaking about art are factors that have grown gradually and increased explosively. Yet, there are very new factors as well. The layman, and not only the layman, pays little or no attention to the differences between artworks and the visual culture that determines our social environment. Life has now become more similar to art than art conversely to art. And lately, the mass media have been recognizing such and they have become jealous, jealous of art and jealous of the art discourse. The mass media are fascinated and intrigued by the idea of casting light on the discourses of the art world and the museum. They are jealous of art speak. We now indeed witness in the mass media a situation how the entire museum system is hailed as a genius, not just the art and the artist. 
It's a place, the museum, where magic decisions are made about what constitutes art and what does not. But more importantly so, the museum has become a place where all sorts of questions are being asked, and these questions trigger all sorts of comments. And most questions are beyond art per se, about multiculturalism, about free labor, about ecology, about sustainability, and of course also about the big society, with the museum expected to mediate the debate. When people talk today about museums, they mean that museums are expected to practice collective bargaining over civic priorities. So museums are not just theaters of thinking, but theaters of conscience as well. Museums have become platforms for a secular culture, storehouses of collective values and diverse histories as well as stories. Places where increasingly we want to spend our free time and trash out issues, big and small, our own and those of the neighbors. Indeed, the public expects us to speak not just about, but also around art. Furthermore, the combining and conversing of digital technologies is forcing art and museums to engage in completely new ways with different audiences. Museums have a long history of exercising control over their content, and so much of both the symbolical and financial value of artworks is purely based on the control of information through the art community. Well, that's completely over. Museums are going to be still reliable sources of information and curators will continue to be authorities, but it's hard to control the terms and speed of information flows. The entrances on blogs, the messages via mailers, the tweets on Twitter, the notes on Facebook. If the museum wants to keep its public role today, it needs to be thought of as a structure of mediation. And that's why we can't stop speaking. That's why it matters that we speak. No matter how, we have to continue to speak. And my feeling that this is that the speaking about art just have begun. Speaking, ladies and gentlemen, in a museum is for better or worse, irreplaceable. We cannot stop speaking. We have to continue to speak. And it doesn't matter how. It's speaking that matters. Thank you. I think that's called thinking outside the box. Um, Matthew Taylor is, is the next speaker up, uh, the final speaker for the motion. Um, he's chief executive of the Royal Society of Arts and has been for the last five years. Uh, previously, he's been a political advisor and, and a politician, but also, also director of the Institute for Public Policy Research. Matthew. Uh, Chris's contribution reminds us of the, the, the old question, which is, what do you get when you cross uh, an arts curator with a member of the Mafia? And the answer, of course, is someone who makes you an offer that you can't understand. Um, <laughs> now, clearly, uh, Ben and Alain have won the argument uh, already. It's not necessary for me to repeat it. Uh, what I, my job uh, in my few minutes is to tell you the pressing urgency of this issue. Uh, for you, the members of the bourgeoisie to whom I, I address my comments, you will soon find out that society is not simply there to provide you with staff and nature is not simply there to ripen your vegetables. Difficult times are coming uh, and art urgently needs to play a role in helping us through these difficult times and that's why we have to fight against deliberate obscurantism, um, academic fustiness, uh, an attempt to hide art away behind a cloak. Um, so let me explain why it's urgent. I won't really talk about art, I just want to explain to you why it's urgent, why you should leave this room not merely having voted for us, as you will in overwhelming numbers, but you should leave this room absolutely determined to do something about it, to go to your uh, closest gallery and museum and tear down things uh, which obscure the meaning of the art, which don't put you in touch with the incredible urgent role that it can play now in society. There are two big ideas that will dominate the 21st century. The first idea is this, we cannot have a better future as a human race unless we change the ways in which we think and we behave. <coughs> there is a gap between the aspirations most of us have for the future, and bourgeois aspirations they are too, and the future that we are going to create if we carry on thinking and acting as we do now. That's the first idea. 
The second idea is that we are not who we think we are. We have labored for 30 or 40 years under the myth of Homo economicus, the pernicious myth uh, portrayed by uh, economists uh, that human beings were perfectly rational, perfectly informed, self-interested, sovereign individuals acting in a perfect marketplace. A totally ludicrous idea on every single kind of level. And now we come to understand uh, that's not a call, of course, who we are at all. Human beings are profoundly social. We are idiosyncratic. We are in many ways deeply deluded as human beings. We are very bad, for example, at knowing or predicting what's going to make us happy. We're very bad at describing what made us happy uh, in the past. Who in this room would like to be a better person? I didn't think so. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask again, who in this room would like to be a better person? Okay, a few of you. Um, well, my advice to you is don't read self-help books. They'll make you more miserable. <laughs> uh, if you want to be a better person, surround yourself with better people. That is what will make you a better person because you are a profoundly social being. So the two big ideas in the 21st century are firstly that we have to change and secondly that we are not who we intuitively believe ourselves to be and we are certainly not the idea of the sovereign, perfectly informed individual that was peddled to us by economists. And those two big ideas will shape the future that we have. Because unless we can think about how it is human beings can operate on a higher level, unless we can understand who we truly are in our idiosyncratic and social and peculiar way, then we will not answer the questions that we face as a society. And we need, most of all, to reconsider the Enlightenment ideas that created us today, the three great Enlightenment ideas, freedom, universalism, progress, humanism. We need to reconsider those ideas. We need to understand that freedom is not possessive individualism. It is self-aware autonomy. We need to understand the basis for global solidarity. What is it that drives human empathy? And we need to escape the hegemonic control of those core enlightenment scripts of science, technology, markets, and bureaucracy and rediscover the possibility of a substantive and ethical debate about the kind of future that we want. Now, who is better placed to lead a conversation about self-aware autonomy. Who is better to lead a conversation about how it is human beings truly get in touch with each other and with nature? And who is better to lead a substantive conversation about the kind of future we really want to craft than the arts community? And so why is it that that community hides behind obscurantism? Why is it that that community makes it more difficult for us to understand that they may be inspired by vision and by values? What we need, ladies and gentlemen, and I know this isn't a particularly beautiful phrase, but we need an era of eudaimonic constructivism. We need an era in which artists are unashamed about getting us to think very hard about who we are and about the world that we live in and about who we need to be and about what that world could be. If we are not able to consider those questions deeply and urgently, we are fucked. It's as simple as that. Now, art needs to be at the heart of that debate, not hiding in white boxes and hiding behind impossible ideas that nobody can understand unless they've got an arts degree, and even then they're pretending that they understand it. Art needs to be at the barricades, at the front of the battle, which will determine whether or not the human, civiliz human civilization survives the 21st century. So don't just vote for us, man the barricades. Sandy Nair. Um, Tim, thank you. And Matthew, indeed, thank you to you, because I think you've set the new era. You've set it in a way that we need not follow. We need not follow because, frankly, we're not hiring you onto our interpretation staff and Ben, nor you. <laughs> Alan, we'll take you on. <laughs> we'll take you on because you've got something that will help any of us working in museums and galleries, which is actually some clarity and some good thinking. And I just wanted to just set out a few more very, very simple points around space, around questions of focus, around narrative, and time. Museums and galleries are good at telling us why art matters. They're good because they organize space. Here we are with a very, very simple organization of space, the architecture, the position for installation, spaces that are made, designed, created, so that we can look at works of art and they will matter to us. Light, walls, surfaces, materials, the simplest things. Secondly, focus. Within these spaces, there are very, very simple points of focus. 
What is the exhibition? Is this a display of a collection? Is it historic art? Is it contemporary? Is it thematic? How do we begin to see that focus? And that focus is set not as a certainty. Of course, as Chris says, it's a set of questions. But the questions have to start somewhere. And they start by the invitation of the simplest kind to come and join that point of focus. Thirdly, narrative. At the point of focus, we have narrative. Works of art are here, they're there, they sit alongside each other, and of course they sit with every kind of textual material from the very first piece on the web to something commented on on Twitter to any kind of interpretive material. Many, many years ago, I remember reading a label in the Museum of Mankind in its old days. In its old days, there was a label of 300 words alongside an artifact of the Inuit, and that 300 words was a description of the nature of Aboriginal spirituality in 300 words. It was impossible, and yet in 300 words, someone had simply set the terms by which one might begin begin to find a narrative in relation around that particular object. And I remember then, many years back, knowing that this was a very simple challenge of the narrative with which works of art can be understood through curating, through learning, all the programs that exist around them, and increasingly, as we've seen. Indeed, others have commented. Matthew and Chris have said it very clearly. That has changed to be more inclusive, to be more open, to be more diverse. In the narratives, curating isn't just curators. We know over many years there are artists, we can think between sculptors from Henry Moore to Anish Kapoor, who set the terms of the narrative. They set the ways in which their works are able to show that they matter. We can take artists of many generations now. We can see from, I don't know, a Jeremy Della to a Richard Wentworth to a Chris Ophelia to a Susan Hiller to a Mary Kelly to any of those artists find the narratives and set their works in ways in which we can follow, if not understand, enjoy, engage. And then to time. The last point is very simple. There isn't, there isn't a clock, if not, setting aside Christian Markley, there isn't a clock at the time that we watch. A work of art in a museum or gallery is simply there for each of us to choose the time. We choose the time we spend. There may not be, in that wonderful phrase of Virginia Woolf's, the zone of silence. We may not have that around a painting. But we do have the choice of time. OK, there's a closing time. But up until then, we choose how long we're there. We choose in that space. And in doing that, we know that we find not just ourselves, we find different kinds of social interaction. There was a wonderful piece of research many, many years back in Tate history in which researchers were trying to find out about how people were using the plan. How were they using the spaces in what the taxi drivers call old Tate this was? And they were allowed, if they saw people with the plan and they were particularly confused and turning it upside down to the researchers could stop them and say, excuse me, are you lost? And people would immediately say, no, no, we're fine. And then they'd see someone else turning the plan upside down, and they'd say, excuse me, are you lost? And they said, no, 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 we're fine, we're fine. And then again, they'd see someone else turning the plan. Well, the plan wasn't good enough, but the point was simple. They weren't lost because they weren't trying to get anywhere. They didn't need to get anywhere. The point about the museum or the gallery was not to get anywhere. It was to have that experience in time in a new way. And as Chris puts it, that dialogue, that interaction between experience and discourse allows every reason why museums and galleries are brilliantly good at telling us why art matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, actually, and thanks to the last two speakers in particular for being uh, briefer, just so that we've got more time to throw it to the floor. I'm going to throw it to the floor. I'm going to take questions in batches of two. Could you wait till a microphone appears uh, so, and speak into the microphone? But let's take questions from the floor. Hands up who wants to ask. Gentleman here first. And is there anyone else who wants to combine? All right. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question about uh, basically the funding of the art uh, in this country and all over the world, because we haven't, none of the speakers have really touched upon, upon it. But 
it seems to me that, you know, particularly when we talk about contemporary art, you know, contemporary art is about selling art. It's not about the values that you know any of the speakers have been speaking about, and why probably a lot of people go to a museum. And I was wondering whether it's the government who's doing a bad job at promoting art. Okay, is there a second question? Um, my question is, um, why are we not investigating the question more thoroughly? Why isn't there a deconstruction of mattering for whom? As if us, mattering to us, why art matters to us as some kind of homogeneous group that we all need and expect some kind of consistent thing out of art and that the agencies that produce meaning or explain meaning don't have prerogatives don't have agendas, visible or invisible. So why are, we, why are we accepting this question in those terms and not questioning them further? Okay, that's great. We'll, we'll do it in the reverse order. We'll take the last question, because if you've asked why aren't we doing it more thoroughly, we should pick up that and do it more thoroughly. Um, from this side first, Sandy, do you want to pick up? Um, it's a great oh, question. I mean, of course, the one point, whatever it is, seven, five million visits made to the National Portrait Gate last year were individuals. Some of them came back more than a few times. Each of their motivations, each of their thoughts, each of their ideas, of course, is different. But there are bizarre correspondences. I look at the visitor figures for any exhibition. I marvel at the fact that 610 people come to eat a car one Saturday and 620 come the next Saturday. And I can't work out why on earth 610 people, give or take, and not 2,000. In other words, there are preferences. And of course, we know that those preferences are enacted socially. What any of us can do is try and make sure that in our particular purpose of running a museum or gallery, we try and get that interaction between the purpose, the possibility, the opportunity, and then allowing as many people as widely. And of course, you're quite right. There are agendas of trying to see where we can extend that. We wish to. We want to share it more widely. It's a very, very definite and open agenda, and we're very, very clear about it. Alan. I think you haven't discussed the question of how we're interpreting the word mattering deeply enough, because this is really what this side of the panel's been, been focusing on, that that discussion is not part of what the museum world allows and encourages. So that if you go to the Tate and you say to the curators, why does art matter? It's as perplexing a question as going to a modern university in the Department of the Humanities and asking, why are you studying English literature? This is immediately considered an attack, and it's considered vulgar, and it's considered as though the only way that you can ask that question is not to be a friend of any possible answer. I'm trying to allege that we should be asking that question much more deeply, um, and that we shouldn't be afraid if some of the answers we get back from our investigation of why art matters are really quite simple. Not that the art is simple, but that the answer of why art matters is simple. For example, people might be popping in to the National Gallery in order to get in touch with something old and something you can't buy. Now, that could sound like a very bizarre and simplistic thing, but surrounded by the West End and by the chaos of city life and by the ever-present modernity of, of, of life, people want, there's a pleasure in seeing something that was done a long time ago uh, that is not for sale. Um, now, that's a very simple... Now, the, the, the question of why things matter is fragile, and it falls apart in our hands if what we want is a very impressive-sounding answer. Some of the motives are really simple. We want to look at art, for example, because it delights us. We want to look at art because we want to remember what it's like to love. We want to uh, take delight in art because we've forgotten why nature is powerful. Um, so these are very simple... Uh, uh, motives, and I think that the curatorial museum world sometimes shies away from them because there's a sort of feeling, oh, if that's all we're in the business of doing, then that's potentially not a very ambitious or serious sounding uh, motive. I think it is a very serious uh, ambition, and we should feel, you know, curators should feel proud of it, but um, I think they're a little bit hesitant perhaps at the moment. I, I completely disagree with you, Alan. At least what uh, as far as Tate, Tate Modern is concerned. Uh, together with the Guggenheim, uh, we are 
approaching, I think this week, about 360,000 users in terms of Facebook, uh, almost that much on Twitter. That's, that's amazing, that's a lot. I, of course, uh, why should I say of course, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, is a bit more, but not that more. But that means that we are now getting into a domain where we can really interact and one-to-one -to -one with the public. And these questions the public are asking are sometimes simple, they are sometimes very, very complex. And I see that what our staff is doing, those people who try to answer these questions, both simple and complex, they really do their utmost best. The funny thing is that right now this communication is happening one to one. So when you come at Tate Modern, there is nobody going to stand in front of you and speaking to you as a group. You will find less and less these large text panels, which by the way nobody really likes to read, but you find other ways of communication, which is a one to one communication. And I really think that uh, all over the world that curators are taking these questions, both simple and complex, more and more seriously. And the funny thing is, and the fantastic thing is, that there are these questions. Because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were no questions at all. The public was saying, well, you know, I'm not a specialist. I don't have the money to collect art. Why should I bother ask anything about this? The fact that there are so many questions means that we are doing our work, that we're doing our work well, because we deliver interpretation. People agree, they disagree with it, but we started to do our work 20, 30 years ago only, and we see now the reaction of that. <laughs> Second remark is, I don't know if you read, if you do read the New York Times, but there was an amazing article last week on June 15, Roberta Smith, who is an uh, illustrious critic, who had to really to say something which I think she felt very, very hard to say. She said in an article, everyone is a critic. She did some participation experiment where people could interact, could react on the words and the lines he used describing and interpreting art. And she was astonished and she said, the level of critique, the level of interaction, the level of participation, not only everybody's a critic, but everybody seems to be an editor. And it's not just because the public is getting smarter and smarter, it's because we do our job for them. Because both Ben and Matt, in different ways, seem to me to be arguing that it wasn't that there are distinctions between different kinds of art, and that different kinds of art matter more. Do you, do you, is that vaguely the case with your argument, or do you actually think that there is? It is possible to make the case that art per se matters, and that's what we should be discussing. <laughs> no, right. Anyway, do you want, do you want to respond? Do you want to respond? Well, I, I did, I, well, I'm sort of still buzzing off what um, Chris was saying. I mean, the sort of socially networked era of art is just about to start. It hasn't happened yet. Over the, in, the, in the last sort of several hundred years, art's tended to be very unresponsive to its audience, which it never really sees. And anyway, decisions are meant to be made by small groups of curators and museum directors and art historians who are all very educated. And every once in a while, groups of artists get together and say, you know, there aren't enough exhibitions <laughs> with black artists or there aren't enough exhibitions with women artists or whatever. And that sort of goes on. All that's about to change. And a few kind of interesting kind of experiments uh, in, in that direction, one of which I reread about a year ago is sort of some OAPs somewhere in a town in the north of England were given the right to curate an exhibition, and they'd actually decided what was going to be exhibited in a particular museum in a town in the north of England whose name I've forgotten. Anyway, we're, we're going to get um, a lot more of that via Twitter and, um, you know, favouriting and um, Web 2.0, and that's going to vastly reduce the power of, um, of over-educated art critics like me and also um, cu curators and museum directors like Chris, and I think that will be, you know, an excellent thing and bring it on, that's what I say. Okay. Matt, finally, we're not going to do it in the panel for every question, but Matt, you had... Uh, oh, well, what Alain just said, I'm sure describes an experience that most people in the room have had, but the confusion in, in what... Uh, Alain's whole thesis is, seems to me that having gone into that uh, museum off Trafalgar Square in order to find something different to the world of what is on offer around it, uh, uh, something old that isn't made to be sold, uh, you're likely to have that experience crushed if you have to go to the room where all the love paintings are. Uh, he, he, he's not only, you know, part of his... Um, thesis is that the curators should actually tell you what the important meanings are. Um, and that telling is a thing that is going to undermine 
the subtlety and strength and richness of the experience that he just so well evoked. Okay, let's take the, f the funding question. Matthew, you wanted to talk yeah, about Yeah, I mean, the funding question is adequately dealt with in the RSA's <laughs> Arts Funding Austerity in the Big Society Room, making the case for the arts by me and John Nell, which is available from the front for nothing. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, well, in that case, you don't need to without, it, without, any, without any public funding, I might say. Uh, I think this, this question of public funding for the arts is very interesting. Uh, uh, very quickly. If you looked at the arts community, the publicly funded arts community, there has been an immense amount of bleating about instrumentalism, that politicians force them to produce art that is in some way kind of socially constructivist. Uh, there is virtually no evidence at all of this. this is, these people are retreating from an invisible cavalry. You know, there is no evidence at all uh, of this behaviour from funders. In, in, indeed, arts uniquely, uniquely free of any of the kinds of forms of accountability attached to other, other types of, of, of public funding, but yet the arts community bleats about it. Um, my view is this. The arts should not be accountable in the same way that doctors should be accountable, teachers should be accountable. That does not mean that they should not give an account, and preferably an account that people can understand. You know? and, and I find you know, it's very interesting. One of my favourite contemporary artists is Jeremy Della. I think his work is fantastic, and for me it's all about communities and engagement and values, and it's really wonderful stuff. But Della spoke at an event that the RSA did with the Arts Council last year, and someone said to Della, what is the kind of social purpose of your work? And, and Jeremy Della said, no, 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 no. He said, oh, you know, no, no, I don't have any kind of notion of social... Because the, this is ludicrous. Of course he's got social purpose. I mean, but the point is that the very notion of giving an account is highly problematic. And this is a b bizarre idea, but it's an idea which infects the arts community, as you've heard from this kind of bizarre obscurantism that you hear tonight. It infects the entire uh, uh, arts community. So um, the, the point about public funding is this. If you got funded by the taxpayer, particularly in what is, continues to be the most socially regressive forms of public spending that the state carries out, the most socially regressive forms of spending that the state carries out, even though it's diminished its arts funding, and I support arts funding, then you should give an account, and that account should be one which is comprehensible by people who haven't necessarily done a PhD in arts appreciate, appreciation. And the idea that that is an objectionable notion tells you something about what's happened to the kind of inward-looking culture that we're talking about tonight. Sandy, and then more questions. Um, Matt, I don't know where to begin, but I'll have to be very brief. I mean, just read... I don't know, just read the annual review you can find on the website of the National Portrait Gallery. It's a simple review that gives an account of everybody here's taxes that we deeply appreciate as an institution. It's only half the funding now. We, we never bleat. Your idea of bleating is way out of date. It's way out of date. It's not mechanistic. It's actually descriptive, and it's quite emotive here and there. It's perfectly clear. It's in everyday language. I think you're just not in touch with the fact is that people absolutely running museums and galleries know, and Chris has said it, we know that we want to be serving as many people as we can who wish to take part and to try and extend that with new media in new ways. And does it worry you that people spend five seconds on average in front of a piece of work, a work of art? Does it, does, it worry that, that there is, well, does it worry you that there is so little evidence of appreciation that is tangible? What, what work have you done? Uh, in your, this world of accountability and openness that you're telling us about, what work have you done to demonstrate, demonstrate a kind of deeper appreciation of that art, in, Matthew, and particularly, I, particularly amongst those who lack your class confidence? It's not a question of confidence. I will give you, what can I give you? I'll give you James, James Elkin's book, why, why, do, why Do People Cry in Front of Works of Art? Um, it's a wonderful book that actually just takes us back to several points, including actually one or two that Alan's made as well about the huge resonance of great works of art and why they do cause extraordinary emotional engagement. I see people in front of works of art for long periods of time as they choose. Others go quickly. People make choices. The point is about the freedom and the choice. Right, let's take some more questions from the floor. Yeah, question at the back there, and then a quick lady at the front here. Um, I think one of the problems is music, museums have kind of got themselves into a cul-de-sac. And I've spent the last four or five years looking into how museums tell you why art matters. And I think they're very good at telling you. The problem is that they're so aware of their audience, they're so aware of the diversity and the plurality that they tell you too much. And they don't allow you. I think what Chris Durkin was talking about was speaking. And I'm all for speaking and I'm all for one-to-one. 
But as soon as you put a caption or a wall text next to a painting, you've got a disembodied word. And the number of people that I've spoken to in my research where I say, do you look at these words? So many people say to me, I don't want to, but I find I'm having to. OK, so, so what's the question? So the question is, how are you going to get away from the words which are telling people context, meaning and artistic intention? Because that's basically what they're telling you. But they're not telling you why art matters because they can't tell you why art matters. Because why art matters is a very personal thing and it can only matter to you. And I think if you use some of, I think Alan de Botton has mentioned the word perplexity and curiosity, if people left museums with a bit more perplexity and curiosity, how do you think that all these words in museums is helping you know why art matters? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question, can we keep the qu more to a question? Oh, that was a very eloquent statement as well as questions too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I work for an Iraqi art collective, and in Iraq, it's very clear why Iraq, um, why um, art matters to them. In Iraq, our museums are depleted, and um, it, you know, art and culture holds a nation together, and its its value and its importance is very clear. But in the UK, um, it would appear to me that you have you already have a very loyal and convinced audience. You have 360,000 people on your um, uh, Facebook website. I'm one of them, actually. And um, is it, I mean, what is my question? Do museums even need to tell us why art matters in England? Is it really, is it as clear? In Iraq, it's clear, but in the UK, would you say it's, there, is a, there is a need in the same way? This is okay. not a broken nation. Thank you very much. I think we can almost conflate those two questions, which is that, that I mean, do we need, actually, to, to, do museums need to tell us why art matters? And essentially, it's a, it's a personal thing, uh, uh, among other things. Um, you want some, ben, do you want to have a crack at that? Um, well, I'm just from, I suddenly got a flashback to when I was 14, which was only um, 10 years ago. <laughs> um, because, and I remembered how much it helped me to the sort of little texts and things, bit of information you got on gallery leaflets when you went into um, art galleries. I thought it was, these things were really useful to me. And I particularly remember sort of looking at, you know, analytical cubism, Picasso and Brack and of 1910 or 12, and it really looked kind of rubbish to me. It was all brown and grey and <laughs> lots of sort of triangles. What, 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 why was that sort of some of the greatest art that had been produced in the 20th century? And then, you know, I read that some Thames and Hudson book or whatever, and, or a gallery wall text, and it told me that actually what was really clever about the, and original about this work was that reality, this ordinary everyday reality, had been sort of rearranged in a, a set of sort of spatial relations within the picture frame. I was like, oh, yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> and ever since then, analytical cubism has been my absolute favourite <laughs> moment in art. And so I'm, I'm really quite grateful for people who try and explain art to me. And you can take it or leave it. You know, I don't agree with all of it, but I think actually people have to make an effort to do it. I don't think we should kid ourselves, as um, some people do on the left, that the art gallery is a sort of neutral space, just a sort of set of white walls or something. It's not. It's, it's heavily loaded, and all kinds of decisions are made before art is put in there. A lot of art isn't put in there, and I think these people should be telling us why they do it. Now, okay. Um, <clears throat> you've got to remember that neutral isn't really neutral. It's the useful thing that's left over from the Enlightenment idea of, of a museum. Uh, We've also got, I think, something that's been lost sight of uh, this evening is the theme itself, that uh, museums are bad at explaining why art matters, whereas, in fact, I would say they're very good at not heavy-handedly doing that expl explaining. Uh, but the fact is that temporary exhibitions are held constantly at museums, and that is the place where the ideas that Alan, and Alan has been talking about, and then actually have rippled up and down the table here, are aired in temporary exhibitions... Uh, curators really make a case for why art matters in that particular moment, in this particular way. Then the work folds back into the neutral environment of the museum where its richness can be appreciated in many different ways by whoever wants to appreciate it at whatever level they are at of being able to appreciate it. So museums uh, consist of the permanent collection, which is displayed in as magnificent and as visually honouring a way that the designers of those spaces can think of. So the implicit and innate, fantastic visual greatness of the work is done as much honour to, but, uh, as, as is possible. And then they consist of temporary exhibitions that are put on that are more polemical, educational, 
uh, more playful, where you can test out meanings, where you can point to certain things, emphasize certain things, and de-emphasize other things. Okay, let's, I want to take some more questions from the floor, because time is very pressing. Other, other questions, other contributions from the floor before I get the, the panel here to uh, kick, kick each other around and summarize. Okay, that's great. Okay, the, the floor's yeah, on the chance. Can I just make one, one very specific? It's very, it's very you, yeah, you first, because you, your side hasn't spoken. Just a very, uh, a very specific point about what I'd like to see more. Because, you know, we, 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 this format re re encourages us to, to, to create false dichotomies. But what I'd like to see more in galleries is a sense of the urgency that drove people to do what they did to produce the art. The, one of the terrible things about the way that young people in particular perceive art, they perceive art as being a lifestyle choice. They perceive it as being a celebrity choice. They see it as being something that people do in the same way as they might do other things in order to make money and become famous and appear on desert island discs. And what is lost in that is the sense that art is about a sense of urgency, a sense of a need to do something, a need to connect, a need to get a, an urgent, burning need, which people would give up anything to do to try to connect with people. Uh, and when I see that, and there are times, you know, I used to go to the Rothko room in the old Tate, and I would sit there, and I would have that sense. You know, I, you know, weirdly enough, I had the kind of youthful experience of something. I just I was listening to the thing over the thing. Why said, do you think no one else does? Because you constantly insult the public and the audience. I'm not they insult, don't have. I'm not no, insult, who am I insulting? No, but you're saying that the people don't. It's, it's all about celebrity culture. People don't well, really spend time. Is it. it not how people perceive modern art now? Who, do, do people not perceive that? Do people not think that the, the modern artist is about kind of lifestyle and celebrity? Oh, jolly good. Oh, good. Well, I'm with you, I'm not with you. Um, uh, when did you last speak to a young person? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I kind of live with a couple of them, and uh, I spend a lot of time talking to them, and, you know... I am one, I think Well, you're not that young, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean young, you know. So. Can I say, I think Matthew Taylor also, when he was talking about living with young people, he was, he was talking about a family relationship, not in a Gauguin-esque way. Um, Chris, your go now. Do you want to come back on this? You know, I'd like to take you on, Matthew, on uh, Jeremy Denner and maybe uh, to address the difficulty he had to make up for your question, what is the social purpose of things? I mean, we all know the work of Jeremy Denner. He likes to work with many, many creative individuals, people who show an earth and see, who walk in processions, who do things in community centers. But the work of Jeremy Deller is leading me to the following. Tonight we have been, we kept constantly talking about the great divide. The divide between the art, the artist and the public. The great divide between the curator, the museum and the public. I've been trying to give you some examples of phenomena which we are going through the past years, which are coming on, which is everyone is a critic, everyone is an editor, but there is a new phenomenon on the rise. That is that, and I don't want to call it boys, but everyone wants to be an artist. Namely, there are so many so-called, I mean, creative individuals, I hate that word, but it's there, who just put their stuff without the arbitrage, without the mediation of the museum and the dealers on the issue. And there will be many more of these. They are not just the homo ludens, they are not just the homo precarious, they are really people who want to do these things because there's an urgency. So we're going to come in a situation where this debate about love and hate relationship, Alan the Bottom, for art for art's sake, I still don't understand, Alan, if it's now important art for art's sake or not important. There is going to be a moment in time when this great divide is not there anymore. Okay. There was a note passed to me to say that we could just let the panel discussion kick around and not do the summary, but we've got five minutes. So I want to ask each of the panellists to, to, to play the game. And for one minute only, I want them to summarise in reverse order, no more than a minute. So, Sandy, would you start summarising, please? One minute. One minute. Well, you had two, so I'm cutting it to one. So one. Um, standing in Rochdale the other week at the new Hepworth Museum as the light shone brilliantly in David Chipperfield's new building upon extraordinarily beautiful early Hepworth pieces, but also great paintings by Mondrian and others that have been lent. It was impossible to think anything other than this wonderful new museum was doing something very extraordinary within complex, economic, social, 
circumstances of that part of Yorkshire, this part of England, this part of the world, still a privileged part of the world, as we all know. And yet, within that privilege, there were people simply wandering and enjoying the experience. There was some discourse, there was much discussion, but in that experience, there was wonderful ideas about why art matters and why it really matters the museums and galleries will continue to do that. And I hope, with your encouragement, they'll do it ever better. Matthew Taylor. Uh, the world needs art urgently to answer the problems that it now faces. Uh, when you go to a gallery or museum, you should feel that you are being grabbed by the throat and told this stuff, what is here, is what you need to understand yourself and to understand the world, to make sense of it and to make a better world. That's what it should feel like, that you're being grabbed by the throat and told, get this, understand this, some way relate to it, feel it, because you need it and you really, really need it now. And so if you don't think, if you don't think, just as a little bit of you that doesn't think that every museum and gallery has that affect on you, that grabs you like that, it fills you with urgency and passion and desire, then you have to vote for our side. Okay, thanks. Chris Durkin, you've got 55 seconds because you took a percentage more than anyone else. 55 seconds. <laughs> the reason that uh, Tate Modern, where I work right now, is um, approaching about five million visitors is proof of the fact that we do our job very seriously. Not just state modern, it's you know, many, many other museums. I mean, Tim opened the debate saying that right now visiting a museum is becoming more popular. People are visiting museums in greater numbers than going to soccer matches. What does that mean? Does that mean, Matthew, that people do not feel represented anymore? That there is a new urge or an urge for self-governance? And people can find that. People can find it in the museum. These five million visitors of Tate Modern, both young and old, average 35%, under 35, they're coming to look at our museum for answers to their questions. And they want to hear much more than just about art for art's sake. They want to hear much more than about the true, the beautiful, the good. They think that art matters because it's about much more than that just that feeling, that experience. They want to think, just like thinking about the Louboutins in the white shoebox. Ben Lewis. I can't remember what I said, but um, a, year, a, year ago, um, a year ago, Charles Sarchi offered his um, entire collection to the nation, and um, there were uh, some phone calls and meetings, I believe, with um, 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 the Ministry of Culture and, and various museums, and the answer came back, um, no thanks. And um, we all know that Charles Saatchi is the greatest collector in Britain of the last um, 30 years and um, that his art really matters. And I'm sure that no one here would want to insult him by voting against this motion. And you're all going to support us. Because news Thank you. Matt, Matt Collins, Matthew Collins. <clears throat> well, this isn't a museum. It's um, Charles's private gallery. There's a danger of sort of the needle of relevance waving a bit. bit. But, um, you know, I don't want um, Piero della Francesca to grab me by the throat, or I don't want to go into the National Gallery when everything's a bit woo-woo outside and where the profundity is, and it's all grabbing me by the throat. I think that idea of art obviously is up art and, and desubtilizes the subtlety and shallows up the profundity of it. So uh, to return to what the actual motion says, that, are, that museums are bad at saying why it matters. Museums at the moment, and with this neutral thing that they do, and they have done ever since they invented, are very good at not grabbing you by the throat and forcing you to have an over-simplistic, childish and infantile idea of the role of art in your life. So uh, I'm, more, I'm totally against the motion. I hope you are too. And finally, Alan de Botton. So really the other side has told us that the point of art is to encourage conversation and to be neutral. Um, I agree with Matthew Taylor, this is not enough. Um, this can't, no, no one would become an artist if that's what art was really about. I absolutely disagree with Matthew Collins. Um, art is absolutely supposed to grab you by the throat. That's why Piero della Francesca made, w became an artist. He didn't become an artist so as to become the, a, a repository for what the curator of the Tate Modern calls a chance for a conversation. No one would become an artist in order to provoke a little bit of polite conversation. Art matters because it shows us what's good and makes us afraid of what is bad. That's a very simple message. Art can be extremely complex and subtle, and yet its meaning 
can be extremely simple. We should never confuse the simplicity. We should never be, uh, worry that when we say what an art work of art is about, we're necessarily squashing the complexity that it took to get there um, in, in the process. Saying what art is about doesn't ruin it. Not knowing what art is about is just dull. It doesn't help you to know. It, I would rather have an explanation that I didn't agree with than no explanation at all. Neutrality simply leads to abandonment and despair. And as I say, museums should celebrate our values and warn us against our errors. That's their purpose in troubled times, and they've deserted their duty. OK. OK, the moment of truth. Um, in the spirit of utter transparency, because we can all see how you're voting. Um, would you put your hands up if you are for the motion that museums are bad at telling us why art matters. Thank you. Would you put your hands up if you're against the motion that museums are bad at telling us why art matters? Well, it's pretty close, but it probably is. And let's just have the hands up of those who disagree. I mean, sorry, those who don't know. <laughs> sorry, that was... OK, uh, so just by a whisker, uh, the motion is defeated. The, the, those, those against have won the motion. Thank you. Yeah.